Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Who can tell me what Ecclesiastes is about? Who wrote it? Who wrote it? Solomon. Solomon. Correct. What did he write it about? What's the theme of it? Anybody know? Listen, when you get to heaven, you're going to meet Solomon. And he's going to say, did you read, did you read Ecclesiastes? What is it? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Solomon, guys, listen to this. Solomon is the man who had everything that us men have ever wanted, ever lusted after, ever desired. He had it. If houses are your thing, Solomon had, he built, it took him seven years to build the house of God. It took him 13 years to build his own house. If that tells you something. 13 years building his own house. If some of you guys like cars, Solomon had chariots, the Bible says. I mean, a bunch of them. More than Jay Leno. Okay? He had them. If some of you, if, if it's money with some of you, Solomon was, there's no doubt, one of the wealthiest men that ever lived in, according to the Bible. If your thing is women, the Bible tells us he had 700 wives and then 300, the Bible calls them concubines. Basically, they were just ladies in waiting for him. And I'm sure, according to what the Bible says and, and sort of just from common sense, I'm sure that whatever kind of woman that a man could lust after, Solomon had at least one of them, maybe a bunch of them. But he had all of those women, he had all that money, he had all the, he had power. Other nations were coming to Solomon to pay taxes to him. And what those were was, we're on your side, Solomon. We know what your uh, father David did. We're afraid of you. We don't, we're not going to start a war with you. We will pay tribute to you, Solomon. And we want peace with you and the people of Israel. And here's our present. He had people paying him taxes. So he had power from basically the known world. He had power. He had women. He had money. He had song. He had people playing music all anytime he wanted it. He had everything. And he, for 40 years, he says, God, let me retain my wisdom. And at the end of that 40 years, he, he's at the end of his life. He sits down and writes it, vanity of vanities. I had it all, and it was a waste. And near the end, there in, in chapter 12, he tells all the young people, remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Don't forget him like I did. You keep your heart uh, fastened to the rock of Jesus Christ. Do it while you're young. Amen? How many of you, I won't say old people, so I'll just say, how many of you old people have regrets that you wish you would have turned your heart to Jesus? A long, there you go. So keep that in mind. Solomon knew what he was talking about. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 Verse 4, this is the cycles of Christian growth uh, and salvation is what I'm going to show you this morning. One generation passeth away and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also ariseth and the sun goeth down and hasteth to the place where he arose. Solomon may not have realized, but he was describing uh, the, uh, the turn of the earth. And by the way, it's a globe. It's round. Thank you. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually. That's a globe. And the wind returneth again according to his what? Circuits. All the rivers run into the sea. Here it is. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. So we're seeing here 
that he mentions in verse 4, one generation passes and another generation cometh. That's a cycle. The sun rises and go down and then comes back up again. That's a cycle. The wind goes down toward the south, but it turns now up to the north because he doesn't have any more places to go. It's got to turn north. That shows you a globe. And it whirleth about continually. The wind returneth again according to his circuits. That is a cycle. The wind cycle. And now verse 7, the water cycle. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Uh, unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. And, and again, we know this because we've had the Gulf of Mexico now for the last three weeks. Bombard our yards and our gardens to where yesterday, finally, Lisa got out to plant some things. Finally. So we got a few more days of dry weather and then we're going to get hit with storms again. And that just goes to show you that this is God's plan. This is how God designed it. And so if you ever, uh, if you ever even doubt that maybe this is your life, uh, I'm just going to ask you if you would. By way of testimony, if you can clearly see the work of God following a cycle in your life, raise your hand as a testimony. There you go. Individuals and their life for Christ, they will go in these cycles. Marital problems, marital issues, they almost always go in a cycle. There comes a time if, if a man and woman are content with staying together, they will go through these cycles. There will come a time when, I, I don't know, it gets kind of rough every now and then. Just abide it. Just live through it. Have patience with it. Pray during that time. God will lift you back out, and all of a sudden, you and your wife, man, you're on cloud nine. Look at that, cloud nine right there. Here's cloud nine right up here. Okay? Let me get my, let's see here. Felt tip pen. Here is, let me, here's cloud nine right here. And that's, that's up in lofty places. But when things are going well, we choose not to call upon the name of the Lord. So what happens? I'm going to show you, it won't be this morning, I'm going to show you from the scriptures how actually the rain coming down is your tears coming down your face. That happens when things aren't right between, let's say, you and your wife, or things are not right between you and the Lord, tears start running down your eyes because you lament the things that you got into. And it just, I mean, it just works that way. Let me go back to this verse, Proverbs 24, 16. If you want to turn there and underline this verse and just write on there cycles, that's what this is. A just man falleth seven times. It is obvious by this statement that if he fell seven times, what did he also do seven times? Get back up. That's a cycle. But the wicked, when they fall, they don't get back up. They fall into mischief. Let me just throw something out there by way of example. Uh, it, it, it is common knowledge, it's not some conspiracy theory, that Hunter Biden is probably one of the most corrupt people whose father ever was president of this country. Amen. That man is sick, he's perverted, he is a drug addict, he is a, 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 a fiend, he is, he is the one going around the world getting money for Papa. The big guy, right? Do you think Hunter Biden living that life all this time, do you think he will ever come out in public one day and say, I've given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and I, I, re I condemn everything that I used to do. Uh, I renounce it. I'm not going to be part of it anymore. And if I have to land in prison for it, I will. But I'm going to tell the story. You think he'd live out the next the, the, the day? Mm -mm. The wicked fall, shall fall into mischief. That means they fall and they don't get back up again. The cycle stopped. 
The cycle stopped. Keep that in mind. Let's go to the prayer, Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings now uh, upon this message. And I, Lord, I pray to your God that you would direct my thoughts and the words that I say. Lord, may they be true. May they be righteous. May they be a blessing to those that are here and those that are listening and watching online. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that uh, you would make us all aware of our status with you. And Father, if any one of us find ourselves in a place, Father, where just we just don't feel right. We feel like we're far away from you, God. We feel like that it's not that you left us, we left you. And Lord, we don't like it. I didn't like it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would draw us back into your love, into your care. You would watch over us. You would deliver us from our enemies. And God, that you would work a, a work in us and give us understanding that though we be in the clouds one day and we think everything's going to be okay and everything's going to be right, Lord, there will come a time, Lord, when we'll be, we'll be on our way back down. But Lord, you do that for us to show us more things from your word and to strengthen us. Father, guide us, we pray, in this message. Bless your word in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Now, remember that tree. And we established last week the rings on that tree show the cycles. Because you have, you have the tree material, the, the trunk material, and then you can see the dark brown rings are where the bark was at one time, and they, that bark got covered over by another, by another layer uh, of that tree. And so let me just ask you a question. When, when you first plant... <laughs> when my dad... My dad loved pine trees. And he planted a bunch of them when he was about 12 years old for a Boy Scout patch that he got. And he planted those pine trees there on his mom, where, where he grew up. And those pine trees were like, man, they were like 50, 80, 100 feet tall by the time I uh, came to be aware of them. And uh, right after my grandparents died, they sold the property. And that guy had somebody come in and log all of those pine trees. They cut every one of them down and sold them for lumber. And uh, boy, that hurt my dad's feelings. So when we moved up here, we lived down here just out by Hematite. Dad went around and he planted pine trees all around the property. And it was a, a real hard thing for him to keep up with his son who would always go behind him and mow him down. <laughs> One time, his dad did it. People. People was helping. They'd come up to visit. He was helping out around the house. And so I don't know if he was mowing or trimming or something like that, but he trimmed every one of them down. And so I don't think, he, I don't think my dad yelled at his dad the way my dad yelled at me over that. But anyway... But he, after a while, though, give it about five, ten years, you can't mow a pine tree down. What happens to it? What do, these, what do these cycles in this tree's life, what do they represent? They represent the fact that that tree not only is getting older, but it's growing. The, the Bible talks about the, the word of God given to us that you may grow thereby. And certainly in my life and in your life, if you are right with God and you are living for God, there will be growth in your life. And if there is growth in your life, then that is Christian growth and those, that growth cycle will be in place. Not only is it getting taller, but it's getting stronger. And so maybe it's like a new Christian. Maybe when the sapling is first planted or when it first comes up, there's a, there's a time there when we're not sure whether it's going to make it or not. We're not sure if the roots are going to go down. We're not sure if it's going to be a, a drought that year or what, and it just won't grow. Or maybe the winds came along and blew it down, or, or maybe some animal stepped on it, knocked it down, or whatever. But give it a few years and give it time. As that tree is getting older, it's getting stronger as well. And the things that, as a new Christian, if, you are, if you're new to this, you're new to Christ, you're new to the Bible and, and His doctrines, 
If these things sometimes don't make sense to you, give it time. Because everybody, including me, was like that at one time of our life. We didn't understand everything. As you get older, you, have, you grow in understanding. You grow in wisdom. But number two, you become stronger. And the things that the devil would do to try to knock a young Christian down and keep them down, as you go older, you're going, stop, devil. It ain't happening today, and it ain't going to happen tomorrow either. You want me, you're going to have to come up with something a whole lot better. And don't worry, he will. Amen? So, Psalm 1 says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. I'm going to show you something about that. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Uh, who knows the number? There is a Bible number that's associated with fruit bearing. Who knows what that is? Huh? Nine. Who said nine? All right. You were right. How long did you carry little bub there? Nine months. How old was Sarah when she gave birth? How many fruits of the Spirit are there? And they're in the ninth book of the New Testament. That just accident. It's got to be, right? Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mind the Lord. I'm going to skip that. Hold it for next week. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. This idea of fruit bearing. In Matthew chapter 5, we call it the Beatitudes. This is the Sermon on the Mount. If you've ever heard of that phrase, Sermon on the Mount, this is what it is. It's in Matthew chapter 5, and it goes, man, it goes for a long way. Chapter 6, chapter 7, all the way to chapter 8 is the Sermon on the Mount. And he, and in, uh, he starts out, Jesus starts out, and understand the, the book of Matthew's placement in your Bible is not by accident. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. The 40th book of your Bible would be Matthew. When you go to the 40th chapter of Isaiah, which has 66 chapters, the Bible has 66 books, you can clearly see in Isaiah chapter 40 uh, the, the same thing that you see in the 40th book of the Bible. Namely, it starts out, uh, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak comfort unto Jerusalem and say that her warfare is accomplished. Uh, and then it says, um, oh, Lord, help me remember it without looking. Um, something about, it's what John the Baptist said. Ah. Come on, brain. What did John the Baptist say? Repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is hand. No, that's not it. Oh, yeah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make us pass straight. That's Matthew, and that's Isaiah chapter 40. And so you have this Sermon on the Mount, and what Jesus is doing, he is taking the religion of the Jews, which had everything to do with the outside appearance. Did you know that you can go to church all your life, look like on the outside that you are right with God, and be fooling everybody and yourself? And die and spend eternity in hell. Did you know that that's possible? People do it all the time. So what Jesus was doing here, he was internalizing the gospel and the doctrines of God. He was taking the things where he said, uh, you have said that uh, if a man uh, commits adultery, then he should be stoned. But he said, but Jesus said, I say unto you that he that lusteth after a woman uh, has committed adultery already with her in where? See, he's taking it from the outside to the inside. That's why I think when they brought, those men brought that woman caught in adultery, and they were wanting, they were testing Jesus, wanting him to uh, condemn her because she should be killed because she was caught in the very act. But Jesus knew their heart. And he said, He who is without sin, let him first cast a stone. He knew they were guilty. 
they may not have been guilty of committing adultery with this woman, but they had lusted with, after women in their heart. And Jesus said, it's the same sin. It's the same one. In fact, I read a verse this morning uh, that was in the book of Proverbs that talked about our thoughts being sin. And that's true. Now, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. And this is the Beatitudes. Let's read them. And I'm going to share with you what I'm, where I'm going this morning. Number one, it starts in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, not the weak, but the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now someone do me a favor real quick and count the number of times, uh, the number of verses where Jesus uses the phrase blessed. Verse 5, oh, excuse me, verse 3, that's 1. Verse 4, that's 1. Verse 5, that's 1. Verse 6, that's 1. Verse 7, that's 1. We got 5 so far. Verse 8, there's 1. Verse 9, there's another one. Verse 10, there's 1. And verse 11, there's 1. How many do I have? So, if I were to ask you this morning, those of you who are saved, those of you who are born again, if I were to ask you, would you like for your life to count for something that benefits the kingdom of God? How many would say amen to that? You want your life to matter. You're not chasing after your own dreams. You're not chasing after this world's wealth or this world's power or this world's sin. As I mentioned before, Solomon already did that. And he's telling us men now, don't do it. Don't go for that. You're not going to find what you're finding or what you're looking for. It's all a trap. You're never going to be satisfied if that's where your heart is. So we have the words of Solomon. Let's take heed to those words. And let's do then what Christ lays out for us. Now, in reading this, I'm smiling because I can see now that I've... Now that I, I've learned it, I can see the cycle that I go in in life. It is also the cycle for those of you who have never asked Jesus into your heart. You're looking at right here, it, this is how God leads you to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to lay this out for you. Let me show you. So we have nine, I should have put that up there, made it easy for you. Actually, if you look at number 8, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 9, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Why did he say it twice? There is a double blessing here between number 8 and number 9. A, if I were to ask you this morning, how many of you need a double blessing this morning? Would you say amen? Amen. You need a double blessing. Did you know that God promises that? And that, in fact, it, it was in Isaiah 40. Let me turn there so I don't mess it all up. Turn to Isaiah 40 very quickly. <clears throat> Look at verse 2. 
Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. After Job went through his ordeal, how did God bless him? Double blessing. He got twice as much, uh, as far as cattle was concerned, twice as much land, twice as many. I mean, he had everything doubled to him for his enduring through this. And he went through that same period. Elisha, who was following Elijah, and when Elijah was taken up, what did Elisha ask for? Double portion. And so right here, what you're seeing is a double blessing. For all, and I look at it like this. Here's one blessing. Here's the second blessing. The Old Testament is the first blessing. The New Testament is the double blessing. Amen? Christ came once for us. That's, that's the number one blessing. He's coming again. And this time, He's taking us to heaven. All of us. All at once. Amen? That'll be a double blessing, won't it? We'll be shouting on the way up into heaven going, The Bible's right! Amen. All right, I'm getting excited here. I better calm down so I can preach. Now watch this. Uh-oh. Let me run through this very quickly. If you want to look at Matthew 5, open your Bibles up there. And I'm just going to run through these. This is number one. If you're lost... If you're watching me sitting here or watching me online or you're listening to me and you're lost. If you ask God to save you, this is how it works in salvation. Number one, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means that we are, as sinners, we are spiritually bankrupt before God. When... When no, uh, excuse me. When Abraham believed God, what does the Bible say about him after he believed God? What does the Bible? What are the words that the Bible says? He it was accounted to him for righteousness. Accounting is a banking word. So Abraham was not perfect before God. But Abraham believed God and God paid off all his debts and blessed him who was poor in spirit. Do you all understand that? So before, before you become a Christian, you must recognize that you are bankrupt before God and that there is zero way for you to pay off the debt of sin that you have accumulated in this life. If you ever think of the stupid lie that people come up with, oh, God's going to weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds. It's, that won't happen. The, uh, Ezekiel 33 tells us that in the day that a righteous man does iniquity, all of his righteousnesses are gone. So the very day that you think, oh, I'm gonna, God's going to bless me. Surely he'll let me into heaven because I do a lot of good things for people. In fact, I joined the Knights of Columbus and I, I do all kinds of service to mankind. You're counting on your own works to pay off a debt that no one could pay. How would you like to have the debt that the United States government has right now? All of you are saying no. But the truth is, there are still people who say, Oh, I, I think my good, I think if I do good, that'll count for righteousness. God doesn't count good deeds, He counts faith. So, what is the first thing that you've got to have in order for God to pay off your debt? Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So number one, you're poor in spirit and you cannot pay the debt. But God says, you're going ha to have ownership of the kingdom of heaven. That's a promise. Number two, what's the second one? Say it, say it out loud to me. What's the second one? Blessed are they that mourn. Mourning is a 
word related to things that we love, uh, when people die that we love. Like, I, like a, when Sister Helen uh, sent me that text, told me about Randy Casey, I wept. You'll never know how m much that man meant to me in the years that I've known him. He was one of my teachers, but there was a, a situation not too long ago where the student became the teacher. And maybe one of these days I'll share that story with you. But we mourn because we are dead. The Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sin. So picture yourself. You're Lazarus. Lazarus is in the tomb four days. A body that's been dead four days, it's, there's, there's no amount of medicine. There's no amount of uh, uh, the electric paddles that they shock people, try to get their heart moving again. In fact, by the time the fourth day comes around, the heart tissue just is, is falling apart. What I'm getting at is there's no way in the world to resurrect somebody that is dead like Lazarus. And you, you were dead in trespasses and sins. And by the way, you were dead because the, the law was given to you, Ten Commandments. And you can say, well, they were given to Israel. Yeah, but you knew about them. In fact, you knew about him before you ever heard a preacher preach about him. You knew it was wrong to steal. Did you not? You knew it was wrong to lie. You knew it was wrong to, uh, uh, to uh, rebel against your mom and dad. You knew those things were wrong before any preacher preached on them. And what Paul said was that shows that the, the law is written on our inward hearts. We know that these things are wrong when we do them, even though we don't go to church, we still know they're wrong. And so you are dead in trespasses and sins, and now, now you're not liking the fact that you're dead. You want life again. Or let's say that this is, uh, let's say that this is in relationships, like a husband and wife, or, a, or a, a, a parents with their children. We went through this uh, with our son Caleb here last year was that there came a time when he literally became dead to us. He wasn't with our family. He wasn't living with us. He was out on his own in sin. He was dead. And, and his mama was crying for him every single day. You know what God did? God brought him back. You know what? That, that gives me hope to know that if God can bring him back to his earthly family, God can bring him to his heavenly family. But blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be what? The word comfort is related to two things in the Bible. Number one, the Holy Spirit. He is called the comforter. So what happens is you're lost, but the Holy Ghost of God comes to you because you're mourning over your sins. You're mourning over your death. You're mourning that things are not right. And the Holy Ghost comes and He picks you up and He comforts you even before you ask Jesus into your heart, even before just as I am without one plea, you, you want the Holy Spirit picking you up and giving you hope once again. Somebody say amen. amen. Blessed are they that mourn for them. And by the way, the second thing is with the scriptures. That we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have what? Hope, the Bible says. And so now you're being comforted by the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden now you remember what John 3.16 said. You may not know a lick of what else is in the Bible, but you've seen enough John 3, 16's around. You know what that is. For God so, say it with me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Doesn't that bring comfort to you? What's the third one? Say it out loud now. I've got to hear it. Blessed are the meek. What does it mean to be meek? Huh? Yield to what? Huh? It does not say weak. It takes more strength 
to not fight for what you think is yours than it does to fight for what you think is yours. Now, I'm going to give you an example. There's actually several in the Bible, but one of my favorites is Abraham and Lot in Genesis chapter 13. The Bible says that the herdsmen of Abraham and the herdsmen of Lot were striving together. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and, th- and he, Abraham took him in as like a son. Gave him, gave him flocks, gave him, uh, uh, gave him land to dwell in, but their herdsmen were striving together over the wells and over the, the, the grasslands and everything like that. And Abraham goes to Lot and he says, let's, let's straighten this out now before it gets too far. And he said, tell you what, Lot, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to just pick whatever you want. You, whatever direction you go in, I'll go the opposite. And so Lot, the Bible says he chose Sodom to live in. And he got Sodom. What happened to Lot and what he picked after that? What happened to Sodom? God destroyed it. What did Lot end up with? Because Lot should have been the one to say, Father Abraham, everything that I have, you've given me. It should be you that has the right to choose what land. I am only your servant. You tell me what you want me to have, and I'll take it. But that's not what Lot did, but it's what Abraham did. And so once that was settled, Abraham walked away from Lot, and then the Lord appeared to Abraham, and he said, Abraham, look northward, southward, eastward, and westward, eastward and westward. Everything that your eyes see will I give to you. Now, how far is east and west? How far is north from south? Abraham showed meekness in his life and God literally gave him the inheritance of the earth. Amen. Now, here's, here's, here's how this works now in, in several ways. Number one, you're lost. The idea of being saved comes to you and, but the thought comes to you, well, if I get saved, then I'll have to give up all the stuff that I like doing. Well, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to do that. I'm going to keep what I've got. And if God wants to save me, he'll just have to save me with all of my stuff. I mean, I like to drink beer every day. I like to and a little sip of whiskey at night. I use, I, I smoke a little marijuana, you know, to help me with my body pains. And I do this and I do that. And yeah, I'm, I'm faithful to my wife, but yeah, I kind of like this gal at work, but it just doesn't hurt anybody. You want to keep all that stuff and still be saved at the same time and God will not have it. You're going to lose what you fight to keep. Meanwhile, the people who have given up Everything to follow Jesus Christ, they're going to inherit the earth. Now, let me apply this to marital relationships. A marriage can be full of fights or it can be full of love. Fight is somebody or both parties in the marriage putting their foot down and saying, I ain't giving in no more. This time, I'm going to win the argument. This time, I'm going to keep what I want. Let me ask you a question. Does that build a loving relationship or does it destroy a loving relationship? You know what happens to guys that will not listen to their wife and the things that she needs, he's going to end up losing most of what he's got in the divorce. Can I hear you say amen? That's how it happens. The best way to... Bond, and I, let me just, let me apply it to relationships here in the church. People, you know, we have people that, you know, are friends to us. You know, we like everybody, but we're not as close to everybody as we are to some people. And let me tell you, 
some of the greatest problems that I've ever seen in this church has been jealousy over relationships. Jealousy. This goes all the way back years ago when I was a child. There was jealousy in the church over who was going to be in charge of the church. Whether it was going to be a, a bunch of women on a board or it was going to be the pastor. And let me tell you something. Those of you who know me, you know I'm not a dictator. Uh, I'm not even a potator. I'm not either one. But th there is one head in every body. And sometimes that head is wrong. But it's still the head. And um, just kind of keep that in mind. I, I don't fight for something that's just not important. But what is important, I will fight for. But show meekness to one another. That's what feet washing does. You, you are meek in washing another man's feet or another lady's feet. You shall inherit the earth when it's all said and done. God will not withhold anything from you. Now, now we're taking a turn. You've decided that it's all the things that you loved about this world that's got you in the situation where you are now. You liked your sin. You liked, your life is full of pride. You're not willing to give, uh, yield anything over to anybody. And that's how you are. That's what got you in the trouble that you find yourself in. So God has to break you and cause you to be meek. And when he does, now all of a sudden, what's that fourth one? Read it out loud. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. See, before you got saved, what did you hunger and thirst after? Women, men, cars, boats, fishing. Vacations, you lusted after the things of this world. You, all, you looked at your neighbor's house and say, well, how come they got a better house than we do? I want a better house. You lust, you uh, hunger and thirst after the things of this world, which are sins. Listen, if sins weren't fun, if sins didn't appeal to our flesh, we wouldn't do them. But because they appeal to us, we do them over and over and over again. But when Christ is ready to work in our life, he breaks us from our pride and he causes us to be meek. And now we hunger and thirst, not after the things of this world, but we hunger after the things of God. All of a sudden now, John, whereas somebody would have came to you 20, 30 years ago and say, hey, John, why don't you come to church with me? John's going to go, I ain't going to your church. That, right? That was a cigarette, not a joint, okay? <laughs> you want a beer? I don't want anything to do with it. What about now? God changed you, and now the things that you hunger and thirst for are not in this world. They're with God. They, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. Listen, there's nothing in the world like getting a good, <clears throat> good greasy meal down in your stomach. Amen? Amen. As I saw a sign one time, there was a pizza company uh, advertising their pizza, and it said, after all, no one says they're having a salad party. <laughs> Amen? Hey, I'm having a salad party at my house tomorrow night. Y'all want to come? How about if I, I'm having a pizza party? Yeah, grease and carbs go together, amen. Anyway, for they shall be filled. What about in relationships? Listen. Now, I would say to you men, listen. God had to show me this the hard way. 
that God showed me, Mike, the decisions that are made in your family, they have to come from you. If I decided I didn't want to go to church no more, what would that do to my children? What would that, I'm talking about when we were young. What would that have done to my children? What would that have done to my wife and our relationship where she says, I am going to church and I'm taking the kids. Then all of a sudden there's division between us. And that division gets worse and worse and worse over time. And I want to tell you something. The Bible's right when it says, uh, um, boy, I'm having a problem memorizing scripture this morning. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen? Where Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If somebody in the families want to serve God and you're not, you're going to be pulling against one another and not with one another. Amen? And it's got to be somebody. If the men won't do it, it's got to be somebody. And my goodness, even the kids... Sometimes the kids will stand up and say, how come we don't go to church no more? I liked church. Can we start going back? Amen. That's not rebellion. That's not rebellion. That's God opening the mouths of babes. Amen. But you, you got to start hungering and thirsting in your relationships after what is right by God, not what is right by this world. That means get your marriage right with God. Get your uh, friendships right with God. If you're in, I'll say this too, business partnerships. If somebody's, if you're in business to somebody that's lost and they're not saved, they're going to want to go a different direction than you are because you're going to follow God. You're not going to steal from this and you're not going to take money from that. You're going to do things honest in the sight of God and all men. So at some point, both, both parties have to be walking on the same track. Amen. So, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. What's the fifth one? Watch this now. Hey, Roy. Oh, Roy. Here he comes. Come in here for a minute. When you were first starting to walk away from alcohol, okay? Now I'm, I, I know everybody's got their opinions. I'm not a big fan of it, but there are some things that work. One of the steps that you had to follow was... You had to go to people that you offended while you were a drunk and do what? Apologize. Repent. Apologize. Not offer them a beer. Amen. Okay. Now, if they forgave you, that's great. If they didn't forgive you, that's on them. But this is biblical. He had to go to people. Starting with his wife, had to go to people and started apologizing to them for the things that he had done while he was drinking. That's exactly right. So that now, Roy, that you're, you know, you've been how many years dry? Thirty-five years. Let's say that let's say that you knew someone that was an alcoholic and they finally come out of it and they came to you and said, Roy, I did things. Will you forgive me? What would you do? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So, God is merciful. God calls upon us to be merciful because we ourselves have received God's mercy. Amen? 
Listen, you will, you will bear less burdens in life if you will just forgive people that have wounded you, that have hurt you. I'm not saying you got to live with them again. I'm not saying you got to fellowship with them again. I'm not saying you got to even see them the rest of your life. Maybe it's better that you don't. But you will always be under the strain of an unrepentant heart. And that, that applies to a marriage as well. If your husband does things and you won't forgive him, who's carrying the burden here? If the wife does things and the husband won't forgive her, did you know that although God makes certain allowances for divorce, He does not ever say you must divorce. He never says it. And I'm just telling you, you want mercy from God, but you're not willing to forgive those who went against you. I'm preaching to me, I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to whoever listened to it. We cannot obtain mercy until we become merciful. But you see, now it's easier for us because now we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. God is mending our hearts. He's turning us toward Him. Now look at the sixth one. What is it? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Your motives for why you're coming to church this morning. Is it to be seen? Is it to, so that everybody can think that you're some kind of wonderful Christian? Why, was, why, why is it that you would even dare make known to people in the church how much you give in the offering plate? I don't want to know that. I don't know if some of you have noticed, but when the offering plate's passed around, I'm not standing up here going, well, I wonder how come they didn't give nothing. I learned that a long, long, long time ago. My wife will tell you that even out at Richwoods, I'm busy doing something. I'd maybe on the stage getting my notes or up here playing the piano or something. Anything but from trying to watch you and, and give your offerings and stuff like that, I couldn't care less about it. I want your motives for giving to be right. I want your motives for coming to the house of God to be right and pure and virtuous. I want things in your relationship. Marriages suffer great torment, great pain, great destruction by someone in the relationship whose heart is not pure. In other words, let's say that uh, the wife has been wanting the husband to do something. And the husband says... Okay, I'll do it, but I'm, I think I'll expect a little hugging and kissing afterward. You know what you just made your wife into? When you require your wife's attention and the price is you going out and doing stuff that she wants done, you're a whoremonger. And you just turned your wife into the whore. Did you know that Jesus died for us and didn't expect anything back? And we're, we're, the, we're the church, we're the bride, right? He didn't ask for anything back from us. He didn't ask for us, now if you do all this, then I'll die on the cross for you. That's not what happened. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Pure love is love that gives unconditionally and doesn't ask for anything back. Amen? That's, that is someone whose heart is pure. Or the things that you do in the church. Are you doing it to be seen? Are you doing it to get noticed? Or are you just doing it because you love God? I could give you examples of things that people have done here in this church. People that are sitting right here right now that I thought was a tremendous blessing. And I know for a fact they didn't do it to be seen. They didn't do it. Uh, to gain some kind of position in the church. I know for a fact they did it because their heart was right with God. And I'm not going to give you their names. I'm not going to spoil it for them. What is, what is number seven? Blessed are the what? You know what, happen, you know what happens 
when you give your life to the Lord, you get so excited about it, what do you want to do? I want to tell others what I've found about Jesus Christ. He not only loves me, but He forgave every rotten, nasty, vile thing that I ever said, thought, or done. I can't believe that God loved me so much. I don't understand it. But I just want to tell the world that Jesus saves. Amen. Jesus saves. Oh, listen. You're a peacemaker now because you go out to people who the, who the Bible says are at enmity between you, them and God. And you go to bring peace to them by showing them the peacemaker. Jesus Christ came to draw us so that we could be one with our Savior Jesus Christ. For theirs is the, oh no, for they should be called the children of God. So God put peace in your heart and you just can't help it, but you got to go and tell someone, amen. Who remembers the day when you first got saved and you were so excited, you just said, tell everybody. And then somebody said, oh, don't worry, son, you'll get over it. Amen. Listen, I don't ever want to get over being saved. I don't want to ever get over what God's done for me. By the way, in a relationship, who's God going to bless? The peacemaker or the warrior? God's going to bless the peacemaker. Then verse number 8, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you got saved, and the very first thing the devil did was attack you. Usually, listen to this now, usually it's your own family first. Because you told them that you're, if they have the family reunion on Sunday, you won't be there because you'll be in God's house. You told them that, uh, you need, I'm going to ask you to come to church with me Sunday because I'm going to tell you what, I got saved last Sunday and I want you to know what it's all about. And so, but your family then, they start persecuting you. They call other family members and you say, yeah, old Joe, he's turned into Holy Joe. I don't know that, that crazy guy. I didn't like him to begin with. Now he's going to go around preaching to everybody. I ain't going to put up with that. And so they start a campaign against you. And who's, who's in charge of that campaign? The devil is. And so you will be persecuted. You will be, you'll get a whipping. But not because you deserved it. But because you didn't deserve it and you lived for Christ. Christ is the one who got a whipping first, is he not? So you will be persecuted, but, verse, the ninth one, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. I mentioned Randy Casey earlier. There's people that like him and people that don't like him, and that's going to be the case with everybody who preaches the word of God. And I don't know his life outside of just knowing him personally, I don't know if he was ever persecuted. I don't know if he was ever defamed. I don't know if anybody ever lied on him. But if they did it falsely, they're going to get their reward. But Randy is about ready to get his reward in heaven for enduring it. Isn't that how you'd rather it be? Would you like to... And by the way, this starts all over again. Because once you get persecuted and... You start, you, you know you're living right, you know you're doing right, and that by, by its very nature, when things go well, we stop praying, we stop reading, we stop thinking about church, we stop all those things. They just like come to a grinding halt. And when they do, we start going back down again. Now I'm going to start explaining that next Sunday. But then it starts all over again. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because you've got sins. That need to be repented of. Blessed are they that mourn. This, this stuff bothers you. Blessed are the meek. You're willing to yield it over to God. Blessed are they which do. See, it starts all over again, doesn't it? And by the way, this cycle makes you so that you either neither barren nor unfruitful. He shall be like a tree and he shall bring forth his fruit in his season. I would like for my life to be fruitful for God's kingdom, not mine. I would like for my marriage to my wife to be a blessing to both of us 
and then a blessing to our children and a blessing to our grandchildren. I also would like that to be a blessing to other people who are encountering... See, we didn't have it easy. We've gone through some pretty tough stuff. We didn't make it known to everybody. It's not everybody's business, but we've been through some things. And God has brought us through those things. And hopefully by that, maybe, maybe, we can help save somebody's marriage. We can help save maybe children who are at odds with their parents or vice versa. That's where my heart is. Let's stand to our feet.